Good morning. Good to have you with us again today. We are in Revelation chapter 9. We've been going through the seals, the trumpets. Now we, as we're nearing the end of the trumpets, we are nearing the end of God's mercy to the, to the world as a whole. We're in the tribulation period. We're moving towards the halfway point. And so we are encountering chapter 9 and seeing what God has for us today. We see a last opportunity for mercy today. It's amazing how merciful God is. Throughout the pages of Scripture, over and over again, we just see God being merciful to us, to you, to me, uh, to the man and woman of God's Word, to the world, to sinners. God is a God of mercy, and His, and he's, his mercy is everlasting. His mercy is he's long-suffering. And yet, we are seeing here the, the culmination of history, of prophecy coming together. Where he has promised to deal with sin. He has promised that he will defeat Satan and he will, he will establish his eternal kingdom. We are on the precipice of that here in Revelation. And so as we draw closer and closer and closer, God's, God's mercy is going to come to an end here. We see in Revelation chapter 5 that, that uh, the Lord Jesus Christ, he is worthy to, to, uh, to give judgment, to dispense judgment on this earth, yet at the same time he's gracious. He gave his life for you and I. He went to the cross for us. He is worthy to judge, yet he is worthy to save as well. He is gracious. That's, that's the twin themes that we have going through Revelation. The judgment of God, the grace of God at the same time. In, in our lives, he's doing the same thing. He's, trying, he's drawing us to holiness, and he's at the same time giving us grace. That's what God is doing. So we come to chapter 9, and we see the trumpet judgments. The final three, two today... These are called the woe judgments. There are three of them, which means, which means that the, the, the judgments are increasing in, in uh, severity. The wrath of God is increasing so much here. It is, it is God's wrath being especially poured out, these last three judgments, yet they are measured. What we've seen so far is, is the seal judgments, six of them. First, the tribulation begins. There is a false peace. It's going to be challenged. The Antichrist is going to begin... Uh, to come on the scene. There's going to be war, world war. There's, there's going to create famine. There's going to be death because of that war. 25% of the world population is going to die. That's significant. Christians are going to be slaughtered. The world is going to literally be shaken with a worldwide earthquake. And then there is silence in heaven. That silence in heaven is the prelude to the seven trumpets that we see. We've looked at the first four trumpets where a third of the earth is affected. The trees, the grass are burned up third of the seas are turned to blood and the life in those seas a third of the fresh water is poisoned and then we see a third of the of the world's light is impacted as well these are the first four trumpet judgments now we come to these these final three these two here this morning and we come to the fifth one the first woe of the three woes the fifth trumpet chapter 9 verses 1 through 12 what we see here is is uh, in these in this passage in the and the fifth angel blew his trumpet and I saw a star fall, fallen from heaven to earth, and he was given the key to the shaft of the bottomless pit. And he opened the shaft of the bottomless pit, and from the shaft rose smoke like the smoke of a great furnace. And the sun and the air were darkened with the smoke from the shaft. And then from the smoke came locusts on the earth, and they were given power like the power of scorpions of the earth. And they were told not to harm the, the grass of the earth or any green plant or any tree but only those who do not have the seal of God on their foreheads. They were allowed to torment them for five months, but not to kill them. And their torment was like the torment of a scorpion when it stings someone. And in those days, people will seek death and will not find it. They will long to die, but death will flee from them. In appearance, the locusts were like horses prepared for battle. On their heads were what looked like crowns of gold. Their faces were like human faces, their hair like woman's hair, and their teeth like a lion's teeth. And they had breastplates like breastplates of iron. And the noise of their wings was like the noise of many chariots with horses rushing into battle. And they, and they have tails and sting like scorpions, and their power to hurt people for five months is in their tails. They have as a king over them the angel of the bottomless pit. His name in Hebrew is Abaddon. And in Greek, he is called Apollyon. The first woe has passed. Behold, the two woes are still to come. 
here we have this this first woe, the fifth trumpet judgment. What we see here is is demonic activity, demonic torment, torment on the earth. This is this is that fifth judgment that we see. We see in this passage, we see a star. The question is uh, in 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 verse one, fifth angel blew his trumpet, and I saw a star fallen from heaven to earth, and he was given. So we see clearly that the star here is not is not a celestial body. It's not a comet, a meteor. It's, there's a heat element. There's a personal personalized element to it, which tells us this is an angel that falls from heaven. And John says, I see a star fallen from heaven. He didn't see the star falling. He saw it fallen from heaven. The question is, is this angel that's, that's acting here, is it a good angel? Is it an evil angel? That's a good question. Um, Isaiah chapter 14 r reminds us of the fall of Satan when Satan fell. You are fallen from heaven. Why? Because it says, I want to be like the Most High God. And he was thrown out of heaven. He's brought down. Luke chapter 10 verse 18, when the disciples cast out demons on their ministry, they came back and they were thrilled about that. And Jesus says, but I saw Satan fall from, he from heaven. In other words, the authority for you to do what you just did has come from me, the one who threw Satan out of heaven. Revelation chapter 12, later on, we're going to see verse 9. And the great de dragon was thrown down, that ancient servant who was called the devil and Satan. In this, in this paragraph here, today he still has access to heaven. He is blaming you and I every time we sin. He's bringing our faults that we have, our, our sin, all those things. He brings them to the God and he blames us. He says we're not worthy. Well, he's, he still has access to heaven, back and forth, back and forth. Here in chapter 12, he will be thrown out of heaven for good. He will no longer ever have access to heaven. So the question is, is this angel Satan? Is it an evil angel? We don't have the answer for sure. Some tie, some tie this angel to the person that we're going to see in verse 11. That's a possibility, but it's not at all a, a certainty that that is a connection at all. It could be an evil angel. He comes down and he releases the evil. In chapter 20, verse 1, we see an angel, and a good angel, a holy angel, serving Christ. He comes down from heaven. He's holding in his hand what? The very key that we see here in this chapter. He's holding a key to the bottomless pit. Some would contend that this angel here is, is a holy angel. He's acting in the service of Christ as he is in chapter 20. Some would say, well, Satan is the one who will be the resident of the bottomless pit, of the abyss, ultimately of hell. He's not one who would have authority over hell in any capacity because he's the one who will be thrown into hell. It can't be an evil angel. Some would say, no, um, this is. And so you can have to come to your own determination. Uh, the key here is this. Whether it's an evil angel that, that is under the authority of Christ or whether it's a holy angel under the authority of Christ, the key is the authority of Jesus Christ. Revelation chapter 1, verse 18. Jesus says, I died, and yet behold, I am alive forevermore. I have the keys of death and Hades. He has the authority over the abyss, the bottomless pit, death, Hades, hell, Sheol, all those things. Jesus Christ has the authority. Whoever has access to those domains does so under the authority of Jesus Christ. That is the key here. Whoever is acting, they are acting under the explicit authority of Jesus Christ. You need to know that. Chapter 9, verse 1. This angel is given the key. He's given the key. He comes down. He opens, he opens the shaft that leads to the bottomless pit, and, and the demons pour out of this pit. Um, and so that leads us to this reality. It is, it is the abyss. It's the bottomless pit. It is a restraining place for demons who have sinned against God. We see in Luke chapter 8, verse 31. When Jesus was ministering and, he, and, and they were cast out of the pigs, they begged Jesus not to throw them into this place. It was known among the fallen angels, this place of torture, this place of prison, this place of bondage, it was well known. and They did not want to go there. It is a holding place. Jude chapter 6 refers to those who were there uh, because of, because of their, their great sin, eternal chains until a later day. And so when the angels first fell with, with Satan, some of those were thrown into this place. Maybe others have then since that time have been thrown into this place. It is a place they cannot be released from unless Jesus Christ releases them. Here for specific purpose. 
And so, and so they are released, and in verse 2, when they released, it is such a scene that even heaven and earth is able to see uh, the impact that this horde of demons, this horde of release from this bottomless pit has. The sun is covered, the sky grows dark, it affects even, even heaven and earth in, in, in that sense. It is a demonic horde. There's, there's no question that this is a demonic horde that is released as part of the judgment of God on the earth. We see their description in these verses. Uh, they're like horses prepared for battle. They're uh, locusts. Um, you know, locusts just devour everything. Locusts on this earth, they look like locusts. They're not locusts. They're not locusts that we see on the earth. They have, they have that appearance. It says here, um, their heads, they have crowns of, gro of gold. It shows their, their, their dominion and authority, their, their power um, under the authority of Jesus Christ. They have human faces. It shows their, their, in, their intelligence. They don't, it says they look like. John's trying to describe what he sees. Again, the question is, is he describing something that is in the world today, something natural? Is he trying to describe something that, that he can, he, he's doing the best he can to describe what he's seeing? I believe that this is that this is a demonic release. That these are, these are literal demons that are being released from 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 this abyss. They have been enchained. They have been in bondage, and God is releasing them. So they take on this persona. Uh, their hair is like woman's hair in the sense that there's just a wildness about them. This this hair just gives lends to the portrayal of the picture here. Their teeth uh, are like lions. They're, they're they're predators. They're they're out to destroy. Uh, they they are seemingly invincible they have these breastplates of armor that are on them the noise is like the noise of many chariots i, I think i remember uh, in world war ii there were these uh, bombers called stuka uh, dive bombers and they would dive down from germany and they would dive down as they would release their bombs they would they would fit these horns on the planes and so as they were diving these horns would be piercing and the people on the on the ground could hear the planes coming before the bombs even hit the ground just just spreading terror in a community, in a neighborhood that heard these sounds. This is the same thing here. There's there's nothing but terror that's associated with this group. These are demons who have been held in bondage. They hate Christ. They hate the inhabitants of the earth. And they are out to get and to destroy. That is their description. We see as well their power that they have. Verse 3, they, uh, they have the power of scorpions. Scorpions have that tail. Scorpions sting. Store, uh, they, are, they are tormenting. Maybe if you're watching, you've been stung by a scorpion. I never have. They have, the power, they have the power to sting. They have the power to inflict great pain on individuals. Uh, we see that in verse 3. We see that in, in verse 5. And they, can, and they can torment for five months. That's how long a locust lives. They can torment for five months here. And so they have great power to inflict pain on people. Uh, there is a limitation in their ability to inflict this pain. Uh, what they are allowed to do, they, they are not allowed to destroy any of the vegetation on the earth. Now, it's already been impacted by, by previous judgments. A third of the earth has, but they are prevented. Because locusts, normally, what they do is destroy the vegetation of the earth. Here, they are prohibited from destroying the vegetation of the earth. These demons, the goal, the focus isn't that vegetation. The goal, the focus, are those... Um, who do not have the seal of God on their foreheads, verse 4. That's the limitation that they have. Um, and, so, and so they are to sting, they are to torment for five months, but it says here in verse, in verse 5, they're not to kill them. In verse 6, those who are stung will seek death but can't find it. Those who are, who are afflicted by this torment, it says those who are not sealed by the seal of God, those who, who aren't Christians, those who have received the mark of the beast is, what, is the counterpoint here. It doesn't tell us that every man, woman, and child on this earth who receives the mark of the beast is going to receive this specific torment. It simply says that those who, who are not a child of God will are prey, are vulnerable. It doesn't say that every, everyone on the earth. They will be tormented for five months they will try to commit suicide unsuccessfully. They will try to take their life unsuccessfully. The torment will be excruciating. Demonic influence in this world today is only rising right now. We see that we see the reality of, of demonic activity all around us, even in, in the United States. Um, 
emotional, spiritual bondage, uh, addictions, all kind of things, physical ailments. We see, we see it at work. Demons are at work today. And now you take the spirit of God, his control over the evil of this world. You take him off of the scene as we, as we see in the scripture during the tribulation. And demons have sway and they have freedom under the authority of God. And they are afflicting and creating torment. Folks, this is, this is terrifyingly terrible. They have a leader in verse 11. We see that. That leader, that leader is, um, here we go. That leader in verse 11 is Abaddon and Apollyon. Um, those two words mean destroyer. They are out to destroy. Um, that's what they're out to do. And um, that's the key. I'm trying to move this forward and it's not working here. Here we go. Um, and so we have that reality taking place. The they, locusts normally don't have leaders. They do. And so the reality is this. God releases a demonic horde to torment those on the earth. It leads us to verse 12 and the sixth woe that we encounter. Let's read that. Behold, the two woes are still to come. Then the sixth angel, verse 13, blew his horn, trumpet, and I heard a voice from the four horns of the golden altar before God, saying to the sixth angel who had the trumpet, Release the four angels who are bound at the great river Euphrates. And so the four angels who had been prepared for the hour, the day, the month, the year, were released to kill a third of mankind. And the number of mounted troops was twice 10,000 times 10,000. And I heard their number. And this is how I saw the horses in my vision. And those who rode them, they wore breastplates, the color of fire and of sapphire and of sulfur. And the heads of the horses were like lion's heads. And the fire and the smoke and the sulfur came out of their mouth. And by these three plagues, a third of mankind was killed by the fire and the smoke and the sulfur coming out of their mouths. And for the power of the horses is in their mouths and in their tails, for their tails are like serpents with heads, and by means of them they wound. We have demonic torment. That's the fifth trumpet, the first woe. Now we encounter the sixth trumpet, and this is nothing but demonic slaughter. Are these, are these uh, four demons over human armies? Is this a demonic army? That's up to you to determine. I, I have no issue with this being a demonic army. Certainly, certainly the, the numbers of angels are beyond description. And uh, there is clearly demonic activity going on right here. We have four horns and we have the altar in verse 13. That's what we see. That takes us back to the throne in the temple, the throne in heaven where there has been the prayers of the saints being lifted up, and now these prayers are being answered by God. He is judging the earth. And where the altar seat was to bring mercy upon God's people, and now it is a place of, of judgment upon the earth. And so we see that reality. God is dispensing judgment. We see four angels as well. Um, in verse 14, release the four angels. These are evil instruments in the hand of God. We saw four angels before who were holy angels. These are clearly evil angels. For We know that because it says in verse 14 that they are bound. We never see a holy angel bound in Scripture. Never here in Revelation, never anywhere. These are evil angels that are released. These are, these are wretched angels that are released. And um, they, are, they are released to bring judgment on the earth. They are bound at the river Euphrates. Why the river Euphrates? Well, it goes clear back to Genesis chapter 2, and we see, we see the Garden of Eden. We see, the, we see the, the river splitting into four rivers coming out of the Garden of Eden. Two of those rivers, we, we don't even know their names today. They are listed in Scripture. And then we see the river Tigris and the river Euphrates still existing in some form. The flood shaped, uh, reshifted everything on the earth, the topography and what it looks like. But Euphrates is, reminds us that this is the cradle of civilization. When God created the heaven and the earth, he, he said at the end of those six days that everything was perfect. It was very good. Satan comes and he introduces sin into the picture and Adam and Eve fall. And sin is introduced and there is demonic warfare for the first time. There is spiritual warfare for the first time in the Garden of Eden. And it is from that location that sin spreads through the whole earth. And so this location is being identified as the place where evil again is springing from and will be judged by God. That is important to understand. And so it is from the river Euphrates, that area, the Garden of Eden being somewhere there, the Babylon, 
the whole system of Babylon, which is going to be destroyed here in Revelation, that's the world system, comes out of this region here. This is the focal point of God in the scriptures, the Holy Land, uh, and this area here in the Middle East. And, and God is dealing with the world from this place here. It's an incredible army, verse 16. 200 million strong, that's what that number is. It's 200 million strong. Are these demonic armies or real armies? Some say it's armies from the east, chapter 16, verse 12. There would be armies from the east in a later judgment that's coming, one of the bold judgments. Uh, is it a Chinese army? Is it, is it Gog and Magog from Ezekiel chapter 38 and 39? Um, those are all good questions. The reality here is that the number 200 million isn't given in, in chapter 16. So, there, so if it's the same army, it's, this is campaign one, campaign two. But it seems to me that this is a specific judgment, is a demonic judgment upon the earth. It is, it is God judging the earth, specifically here. And then the bold judgment will be another judgment that is an element in the hands of God. What we know here is that these demons are equipped for death. They are equipped to kill, verses 17 to 19. Uh, they're on their horses. They're equipped uh, with breastplates, again, invincible. Color of fire, sapphire, sulfur. They have the three plagues uh, these, the, that are mentioned, fire, smoke, and sulfur. Uh, that's the reality here. And what we see here is, the, is the, judgment, the judgment of God. They have serpents. Their tails are like serpents. They wound with those serpents. They're, they are built and equipped for simply to, to bring murder, death, destruction. That is it. And they are released on this earth. Uh, it is the judgment of God on the earth. What we see here is God's clear judgment, and what we see here is God's mercy. It's hard to see. It's hard to understand. His judgment is this. It says here twice in this passage, verse 15 and in verse 18, that a third of mankind is, is slaughtered. A third of mankind is killed because of this judgment. Folks, that is judgment, and that is mercy, because... There is still a, an untold population of the world that is living and is able to receive grace before their lives are snuffed out by the judgment of God. This is the last limited judgment of the judgments left. All the judgments have been limited in some way up to, through this one. This is the last one. The rest of the judgments that will come will be worldwide. And so we look at the tribulation, we look at the revelation and this tribulation period. What have we seen so far? Well, we've seen the fourth seal. One-fourth of the earl of the world was killed. We see the fifth seal. Christians are slaughtered. There's not a number given, but they are, they are in heaven. People from every tribe, language, people group, every nation is there. Multitudes are being slaughtered. The second trumpet, a third of the water is impacted, and a third of the ships are destroyed, which means people on those ships are destroyed. The third trumpet, many, many die because of the waters that are poisoned by the comets that fall to the earth. They're poisoned and they die. Here we have the sixth trumpet. Um, a third of the earth is killed. So up to this point, we're nearing now the halfway point of the tribulation. Up to this point, over half of the world's population has been killed by the judgment of God or by being martyred and slaughtered as Christians. Folks, that is, that is beyond comprehension and it's going to get worse. This clearly is the judgment of God on the earth. And never take lightly that God judges sin, that he hates sin. He is judging mankind on the earth for the sin of the world. And yet this isn't even the final judgment. This isn't the, the great white, white throne judgment where, where every unbeliever, man, woman, and child, will stand for final accountability, final judgment before God, spiritual judgment, eternal judgment. This is judgment leading to physical death, not spiritual in the sense of eternal damnation yet. We have a clear reminder here. I want you to see this and understand this. In the midst of all this death and dying, you need to know this. This is God's heart. God says, I don't have any pleasure in the death of the wicked. God doesn't take pleasure in judging sinners and in taking their lives. He says, this is what I would rather. I would rather that they turn from their sin. The Lord would rather that you and I turn from our sin and turn to Him than have to judge us like this. He wants you and I to live. He wants us to have an abundant life. And all it takes is for us to turn in faith to Jesus Christ to receive Him as, as Savior. We have seen demonic torment, demonic slaughter. And now we come to verse uh, chapter 9, verses 20 and 21. And the rest of mankind who were not killed by these plagues 
did not repent of the works of their hands, nor give up worshiping demons and idols of gold and silver and bronze and stone and wood, which cannot see or hear or walk, nor did they repent of their murders or their sorceries or their sexual immorality or their thefts. What we see here continuing further is demonic activity of the heart, demonic hardening of the heart. You know, it's amazing when, when, when we are judged by God, we either run from God or we run to God. Here the world is running from God as fast as they can. We are reminded in the first six judgments when they took place, what did the people do? As the mountains were falling down on them and people were dying, they, they ran to the mountains for protection, oddly enough, and they also cried out, hide us from the wrath of God. Not run to God to find grace, but to hide themselves from God. They're doing the same thing here. They're saying, who can stand? The one who can stand is the one who comes by grace, by faith to Jesus Christ. Here it says they have not repented. This is a reality check in our life. Let me, let me just put it this way as we close. This is important to us. This is a significant catalyst, these two verses in the book of Revelation. Jesus Christ is dispensing the judgment of the Father. He's dispensing the ju divine judgment against sin. He has given man every opportunity to respond to grace, to judgment, to find grace. He's given man every opportunity to turn to him. Man is refusing as a whole. Man is refusing to turn to him. From this point forward on, mercy is going to be removed. Grace is going to be removed. Yes, there's still going to be some saved. Yes, Israel is still yet to turn to Christ as a nation. There is still grace taking place, but as a whole... God is now going to begin dispensing judgment on the whole world. Spiritual blindness is very real. We see demonic, demonic activity in this chapter. We see it in our lives and in our world today. Don't say, well, this is just in the tribulation in those seven years. I'm not going to be here. Folks, the demonic activity of what's taking place here in Revelation is taking place in the world today as well. What we see in their re response to the Lord, their unwillingness to repent and to turn from their sins that are listed here is spiritual blindness. The God of this world has blinded them, the mind of the unbeliever, to keep them from the gospel, to keep from them turning. That's what he's doing here. You see, we're blind when we disregard God's truth. When anyone hears the word and does not understand it, the evil one, that's what he does. He comes and he snatches the word. As you're listening to the word of God right now, as you're opening the word of God on your own, as you're, as you're studying, as you encounter the word of God, it may touch your heart. Satan is right there to snatch it. To an unbeliever, he'll do everything he can to snatch the word so that has no influence in the life. Even to the believer, he's seeking to right now to take the word of God and remove its influence from your life. He wants to undermine the word of God in our life. There's a blindness that comes. Even believers can be blind, not ultimately to spiritual truth, not ultimately to Christ, but we can have blind spots in our life. And we can be blind and Satan can still take the power of the word of God away from us. We need to be so careful to have clarity of vision to see Jesus Christ and look upon him. When we disregard God's word, there's a blindness that's taking place in our life. When we reject God's truth, there's a blindness, spiritual blindness. The wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness, who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. See, when, when I'm not right with God, that's exactly what I do. I suppress God's word. I suppress its truth in my life, its influence in my life. God says, you know what? I've made the word of God plain to the whole world. We've talked about that. Every man, every woman, every child is, is going to be, he says right here, they are without excuse. The word of God has been declared through creation, through the conscience of man, through, through the power of God in such a way that every man, woman, and child is without excuse. When I reject God's truth, there's a blindness in my life. This is the atmosphere that we minister in when we seek to strive to share the good news of Christ. We are encountering hearts where there is spiritual warfare going on. We are blind when we stop listening to Christ. The minute you and I quit listening to Christ, quit opening the Word of God, quit hearing what the Spirit of God would say to us, quit listening to other believers trying to influence into our life, there's a blindness going on. Jesus and Pilate, Jesus says, I, ca I came to bear witness to the truth, that's why I came. Everyone who, who is of the truth, understands truth, listens to me. The call to your life and mine is to be those who listen to Jesus Christ, who listen to his word, who live his word, communicate his word, who love his word. Pilate said, what is truth? His question should have been, who is truth? Standing right in front of him, Jesus Christ. 
We're blind when we follow our own heart. This is the creed of the world, folks, right here. Although the world knew God, they became futile in their thinking, in their foolish hearts. Their hearts were dark, and they gave, God gave them up to the passions of their hearts. You know, we find a world that is passionate about many things. Those passions are, are not directed towards Christ to accomplish the will of Christ, do not reflect the heart of Christ. They are self-oriented passions. Our world is driven in its media, in its advertisements, in its movies, in its shows, in its culture, in its teaching and schools. The passions of this world are follow your heart. Our hearts are sinful. Our hearts are wicked. We can't trust our hearts. You can't trust your heart. God gave us a heart. He speaks to our heart. He conforms our heart. He shapes our heart. We have to listen to him. We have to listen to the voice of Jesus Christ in our heart, not listen to our heart first. Whatever we hear needs to be sifted through the, the, the grid of God's will, God's favor, His desire for us. When we set our own standards, we're blind. It is demonic. In those days in Judges, everyone did what was right in their own eyes. That is demonic. These are all demonic activities. Folks, when you follow your own heart, it is demonic. When you, when you set your own standards in your life, that is demonic. When you reject the truth of God's word, that is demonic. This is demonic activity that takes place. It is all around us, and believers are influenced too. I believe the scriptures are clear that a true child of God cannot be demon-possessed, but we can be influenced by evil all around us. We can be influenced by demonic activity. We cannot be possessed because the Spirit of God lives within us. He can never be displaced in the heart of a believer. He can never be overthrown on the throne of the heart of a believer. We are weak when we don't listen to Him, when we don't respond to God's Word, to His truth. We can never become unsaved, possessed, under the control of Satan again. But we can, we can make a choice not to follow God and to follow after our own passions. We always have the power, though, to have victory. We always have the power to say yes to the will of God. We're blind when we deliberately sin, when we reject grace. If we go on deliberately sinning, after receiving the knowledge of the truth, folks, there's nothing left. There's no sacrifice left, he says. Only the ex expectation of God's judgment. Especially the one who has outraged the spirit of grace. Here and even in the book of Revelation, in this time right here, grace is being extended. In the midst of this horrific judgment, grace is being extended. There is always opportunity for grace as long as we are alive. When you, you and I deliberately sin, when we allow sin habits to stay in control in our life, when we reject the grace of God and its power to change us, then there is demonic activity. It is all of Satan. No, it is all of the evil that he spawns. It is of this world. It follows after his values and his evil. Folks, we need to always constantly be engaging our own heart and yielding it to Jesus Christ. We always need to be aware that as we are sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ, the good news of Jesus Christ, that we are encountering hearts where there is spiritual warfare going on, where there is a desire to, to be one's own person, to follow one's own way, to, to follow one's own heart, to set our own standards, because to be saved is to let Jesus Christ take control. That is spiritual in nature. There is demonic warfare opposed to, to that commitment. That's what we engage when we're sharing the gospel. When we refuse to repent, repent, there is demonic activity. The rest of mankind were not killed by these plagues. They did not repent. See, final indictment on mankind here. What comes in the rest of the tribulation is a response to that reality right there. The amazing thing here is they did not give up worshiping demons. They did not give up following those values that are demonic, that are worldly. The very ones that they follow, the very values that they follow are the very entities that are out to destroy them and are killing them. Demons here are killing the worshipers of demons. They are killing the very ones who have followed them, given their life to them, taken the mark of the beast, whatever that might be. It's amazing how, how we are so blinded by sin that we follow in sin patterns and we follow, we follow those who lead us to destruction, yet they're the very ones who are destroying our life. We cannot see because we're blind, only by the grace of God. Folks, pray. Pray earnestly that God would give open doors and that he would open hearts through your testimony and mine, that our life and our words would match together and that the grace of God would turn the heart that's under the domain of Satan and bring it into the domain of Jesus Christ. 
from bondage to freedom. We also see, we've got to show you the other side of the coin here. There is a divine hardening as well. You need to know that. You need to know what the scripture says. Unbelief here, they refused to repent. So because of that, let's see this. Jesus, when he ministered to Israel, he had done so many signs before them, but they still did not believe. They still didn't believe. So what? He has blinded their eyes and hardened their hearts so that they can't see. He did that on his, in his earthly ministry. He does that here in Revelation. He still does that today. We don't know when. He doesn't know how. We don't know at one point he chooses to do that in the life of a believer. We don't know those things. We're not privy to that information. But we do know that there sometimes comes a point in time where because of the hardness of our heart, then, then God himself hardens our heart. Israel, 2 Corinthians Israel's heart has been hardened. To this day, when they read the Old Covenant, the Old Testament, the Word of God, that same veil of unrepentance remains. But here's the thing. Christ can take it away. Oh, God, His grace is always there. The grace of Jesus Christ is always there. Because this is the ultimate reminder. Yes, He may harden, but He is always the God of grace. Joel chapter 2 the context is the day of the Lord here, the judgment of God. This is what we're reading here in Revelation. Who can endure it? No one can. But in the same context, in the same chapter, this is what we read. This is about Israel, but it also can be true of us. He says to Israel, return to me. It would say to us, if you and I are reading that today, come to me. This is what he says. Yet even now, declares the Lord, return or come to me with all your heart. Rend your heart and not your garments. Come to me genuinely from your heart. Don't, don't make exterior life changes. That's not what I want. I want relationship. I don't, I don't want, I don't want your, your efforts. I don't want your spirituality. I want you to yield to me from the heart. Return to the Lord your God, for He's gracious. He's merciful. He's slow to anger. He is abounding in steadfast love, and He relents over disaster. We see in Revelation 7, He is saving multitudes from around the world are being saved. Every nation, tribe, people, and language. Salvation belongs to our God. So the call of the passage is, you need to choose Christ if you've never done so. Receive Him as Savior. Today is the day of salvation. Today is the day of favor. While you are alive, you are still, you are still able to receive the grace of God, we believe. Today is the day to receive Christ. For you and I who know Jesus Christ as Savior, we are simply to reflect Jesus Christ. I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. It's the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes. That's our message. That's our call. This is a hard passage. Judgment is, this, this kind of judgment is mind-boggling. It unsettles me. It unsettles us to see, to see God bring this kind of judgment against the world. Yet he is holy and righteous. He is worthy to do this. Yet even as he does this, he's a God still of grace. Even as hearts are being hardened, grace is still available. Even as judgment now will be unleashed against the whole world, grace is still available. We're still going to see that grace here in the book of Revelation. Never lose sight of the fact that God is a God of grace. Thank you for joining with us. Next time we meet, we'll look at chapter 10. Continue moving forward in that. May his word continue to change your life, impact you for Jesus Christ. Thanks again for joining with us. We'll see you again next time.